Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. I'm v. Christensen, the Florida Greenway Coordinator for the East Coast Greenway Alliance. I'm really excited to kick things off for our lunch session today and introduce our first speaker. With over 25 years of transportation planning experience, Weiwei Shen has worked in many areas of planning. Weiwei has worked on the development of the Florida Transportation Plan, the single overarching statewide plan guiding Florida's transportation future, and has served as a project manager for the East Central Florida Corridor Task Force and the I-75 Relief Task Force. These and other projects have been cooperative efforts between the Florida Department of Transportation and regional partners to establish long-term visions and build consensus for statewide transportation corridors. Both long-range planning and consensus building are key aspects in the work that we do in Trails and Greenways. So please join me in welcoming to our virtual stage, a leader in transportation planning in my region, the Florida Department of Transportation's principal planner, Wei Wei Shen. Thank you, V, for the great introduction, and thank you, everybody. Um, good afternoon. I was going to welcome you guys all to Florida for the face-to-face -face meeting on behalf of the secretary, but uh, things change, and we're not able to do that. In today's presentation, what I'm going to briefly go over with you are some key initiatives that we have going on at the Florida Department of Transportation. I'm, I'll talk to you about the department's vital view, the Sun Trail program, the strategic intermodal program, some of the planning challenges that we're faced with right now, and also um, share our safety vision with every one of you. Okay, if I figure out how to advance the slide, all right. Um, the, department, the department's vital view focuses on four key issues. The first one is that we need to um, attract, recruit, train, and retain a strong workforce. The pay of the state employees have fallen behind compared with the private industry and also compared with local and regional governments. Um, for example, I just fairly recently lost our friend V to another um, agency. So um, we all have, have some challenges ahead of us to um, make sure that we have a very viable workforce. Um, the next three vital few items are sort of outward facing. The first one is that we need to improve safety in all our transportation modes. And second one is to enhance mobility in keeping with our mission of efficiently moving people and goods. And then we need to embrace innovation in every aspect of our agency. Sometimes when we talk with employees, um, we get innovative ideas, but they don't know um, how these ideas get implemented. So we're focusing on generating innovative ideas as well as getting them all implemented. Um, by following the 80-20 rule, if we focus our um, focus on a few things that are vital and the remaining things are just gonna be um, improved as well. Um, with more than 600 people moving to Florida each day and more than 126 million visiting each year, FDOT is dedicated to building a safe and efficient multimodal transportation system that'll fit the diverse needs of our growing population for decades to come. We all have to look a bit ahead, maybe even 50 years to see what's coming. What do we need to do? To that end, we continue to strengthen Florida's robust trail system. One of the ways that we're investing in our trails is through the shared use, non-motorized trail system, also known as the Sun Trail system. This program is, is essential to developing the statewide system of interconnected paved shared use trails, otherwise known for bicyclists and pedestrians. Um, 
in my decades of working with FDOT, none of any other programs generated as much goodwill from the stakeholder community as the central system. Basically, um, the, the program was instituted by the legislature in 2015. Every year we get $25 million set aside um, from the new vehicle tag revenues to be used on the central system. The goal is to develop a statewide system of paved non-motorized trails for bicyclists and pedestrians. Um, it, it's, it's a prior, these um, paved trails are a subset of a priority system established within the Florida Green, Greenways and Trails system. Um, since 2015, what we've worked on is that we had extensive stakeholder outreach. We worked with our stakeholders and members of the public collaboratively to establish funding eligibility and prioritization criteria for the program. I just wanted to um, brief, briefly talk to you to showcase to you um, some sample trail projects that we've been able to work on. Um, the Coast to Coast, Coast to Coast Trail is a developing 250 mile regional trail system. Um, once it's completed, it'll connect Tampa Bay and the Gulf of Mexico to the Atlantic Ocean. We'll have over 180 miles of existing trails in segments. Uh, we're in various stages. The, the whole entire trail is in various stages of completeness. And this is a priority for the Sun Trail system. And we make sure that <clears throat> we fund everything possible um, each year. Um, when, when coast to coast projects are becoming ready to be programmed, we give them first priority. Recently, the construction of the Starkey Trail in Pasco County near Newport Ritchie, <coughs> excuse me, was completed with funding from the Sun Trail system as well. Um, it used to be called the Starkey Gap and now it's the Starkey Trail. The second regional priority trail is the St. John's River to Sea Loop. It's a complementary route of the East Coast Greenway. Um, it, developing 260 miles regional trail system. When it's complete, it'll connect five counties in East Central Florida, as you can see in this map. Um, over 110 miles are existing. We, <clears throat> We programmed more than $25.8 million in our five-year work program through 2023-2024. And several central funded construction projects are complete and closing gaps within the regional system. Um, you can see some samples on the slide. Others pre-construction phases are funded through the central program as well. So we're trying to connect the gap, um, complete the gaps within the St. John's River to Sea Loop as well. Since inception in 2015, the central program has allocated over $99 million um, in the past and current year adopted work program statewide. Along the East Coast Greenway, funds from the Central Program and federal sources extended the Tamuquin Trail near Fort George Island Cultural State Park to the city of Jackson, Jacksonville. The trail segment opened last April and um, part of the funding was provided by FDOT and combined with the federal sources beginning in 2015. We've also um, programmed over $121 million of Sun Trail funding um, to the tentative work program. And we're building the draft preliminary tentative work program through fiscal year 2026. And um, the, this trail will um, ultimately be adopted. Um, the program will ultimately be adopted uh, July, 2021. So um, in addition to the Sun Trail system, I was also asked to um, give you a brief introduction 
about the strategic intermodal system that's uh, um, a very important for transportation in Florida. So instead of me reading you a slide, I would like to show you a video to give, give you a brief intro about the um, strategic intermodal system um, through a video.
improved launch facilities in the country, improvements to Cape Canaveral intermodal requirements, and include enhancements to areas such as commercial spacecraft processing, launch vehicle storage, horizontal launch processing capabilities, booster recovery, and more. The Strategic Intermodal System is a large and complex network, but ultimately its objective is simple, to enhance Florida's economic competitiveness and quality of life by ensuring the efficient movement of both people and freight within Florida, in the United States, and to the world. To learn more about Florida's Strategic Intermodal System, connect online today. So the cha planning challenges that we're faced with right now with sea level rise, pandemic, um, we're, how do we plan for deep uncertainty for the long term? Um, how do we provide our, our visitors and residents with more transportation choices? So we need to think outside of the box a little bit to come up with more um, innovative ideas. As we say in Florida, we have a quintimodal transportation system including space, but how are we gonna get the tr different transportation modes to be interconnected with each other so, so people would have more choices um, in their daily lives? Um, Lastly, before I use up my 15 minutes of fame, I would like to share our vision zero safety vision with you. Um, I was told that Oslo has um, achieved zero fatality last winter. So it, it's a lofty goal, but with our collaborative efforts, we can get there. Um, one fatality is too many. So that concludes my presentation. I'll give the floor back to, um, to me. Thank you for your remarks, Weiwei, and uh, we're so honored that you were able to join us for our first ever virtual summit. Um, my name is Devin Cowens. I'm the summit and event specialist for the East Coast Greenway Alliance, and I have the pleasure of introducing Andy Clark of Tool Design. I first want to say thank you to Tool Design for sponsoring this event and making this event possible. Uh, my team is so excited to be able to bring this content to you virtually. Andy has been at the forefront of the biking and walking movement for over three decades, both in the United States and Europe. He spent his career trying to improve, analyze, and explain complex transportation policies, programs, and procedures so that state and local agency staff and community groups can create more bike-friendly and walkable communities. Andy serves as director of tool, director of strategy at Tool Design Group. Um, and we're lucky we get to work closely with Andy as he serves as a member of our board of trustees. And Andy's been a long time advocate, advocate and supporter of the East Coast Greenway. Andy. Devin, thank you very much. I appreciate the introduction and it's a pleasure to be with you. And um, as others have said, and we'll continue to say, I wish we could do it in person, but here we are dealing with the um, situation uh, in front of us, adapting to, uh, to current conditions. And I wish you all well. And um, should start by complimenting uh, Dennis and the East Coast Greenway team, all of you for taking the tough decision a month or so ago to um, to go virtual for the conference. Um, in retrospect, uh, that seemed like seems now like a really, really smart decision. I know it was tough to do at the time, but um, thank you for having the uh, prescience to do that and the wisdom to do that and um, to um, roll with it and um, get us all together in the best way that we can. Um, I'm gonna turn off my video. Um, uh, and, and switch over to slides. So um, good to see you all and look forward to um, switching my uh, screen back on when I'm done and we've got time for some questions and answers. But let me um, see if I can switch us over to uh, the presentation that I have in store for you. So let me switch the video off, share my screen and see if we can get to the right place. I'm sure people will tell me if, uh, if we're not seeing a screen that says Quartz Coast Trail, who really benefits? Um, 
again, pleasure to be here and thanks for having me. And um, we're delighted that Tool Design could um, support the conference in a small way and appreciate all the work of the uh, rest of the program, uh, the participants and the people who put the program together. So um, as uh, Devin mentioned, I, I'm, I am a trustee of the East Coast Greenway Association Alliance. It's a privilege to be on a tremendous board and to work with a phenomenal staff who are um, reshaping the uh, East Coast of America. And we appreciate uh, all the work that everyone does in support of that. Um, I've been, this is my second full year on the board and we're um, looking forward to uh, a, a um, when things have returned to what well, passes for normal um, to uh, engaging in some strategic planning to figure out where the organization and the uh, alliance goes next. Um, so uh, delighted to be uh, with you today. Um, currently, my day job is uh, Director of Strategy for Tool Design. We're a planning, design, and engineering firm working on active transportation projects all over the country. Uh, I've been with Tool for about four and a half years, and prior to that, spent 13 years as the executive director of the League of American Bicyclists. Um, and uh, I hope that's given me some insight into the minds of the users and participants and the developers of the East Coast Greenway um, in all its glory through, uh, through its 3,000 miles. Um, the benefit, I guess, of working in this field for a while, as Devin mentioned, is, um, uh, is uh, really appreciating the value of physical activity and the, the physical activity that the Greenway enables. And I'm sure uh, Gil and Dennis and others have mentioned this in, in, in uh, other sessions, but it, it's worth repeating today, particularly um, just how important physical activity is and the opportunity to, uh, to give people to, to be physically active, both for their physical condition and for mental well-being cannot be underestimated at this particular time. And some of you will know that yesterday Tool Design hosted a uh, webinar on how cities and agencies are responding to and can adapt to the COVID-19 crisis by creating more space for people to be physically active while remaining physically distant. And um, it, it was a, it's a critical topic um, reflected in the fact that, that um, there were over 1300 people registered for the workshop. Um, and I hope that we were able to share some good tips as to how we can take advantage of this magic bullet of physical activity to help us through these uh, difficult times. Um, people have, have said uh, frequently that cycling and, and walking, active transportation, um, is sort of the answer to almost any um, crisis, uh, whether it's uh, pandemics or hurricanes or earthquakes. The first people you see on the scene are um, gawkers on bikes and, and people uh, walking and, and just um, getting out and, and um, sort of reconnecting with each other. Um, and that is definitely one of the, the enormous benefits of bicycling and walking. They are extraordinarily positive uh, activities and things to be promoting. Um, and over the years, um, you know, I've also spent time working at Federal Highway Administration, a couple of years at the Rails to Trails Conservancy, um, have quite a compilation of books and, and reference guides, a lot of which are heavily focused on making the case uh, for the economic benefits of bicycling and walking and trails. Um, and there's a, you know, a really good story to tell um, all across the country, there are studies and reports uh, on um, the, the economic benefits couched in a variety of different ways. We've all been involved um, and I've been talking for years to try and make the case for trails and greenways and for bicycling and walking. Um, these are five-year-old slides when I was at the, at the League of American Bicyclists documenting study after study, presentation after presentation on the economic benefits of individual streets, of corridors, studies that show how cities benefit from more walking and biking and from trails, how regions benefit from the economic activity generated by trails, how states benefit from the, uh, from the industry as well as the, uh, the activity of cycling and walking. Uh, we know how individual users benefit economically, mentally, physically, um, it you know really feels like we uh, have made the case, but but are compelled to keep 
trying to make the case uh, because it, it still seems like it doesn't always get through. And even when you're faced with the, uh, the magic bullet or the magic number that uh, each, uh, each time we walk or bike, we are a net positive to the, uh, to the local and the national economy while driving is a net cost to, to, to those economies, uh, it still seems like we have to uh, keep making our case over and over again. And the last two conferences that the Alliance has hosted have uh, generated um, you know, fantastic reports on the economic benefits of trails in the Triangle area uh, two years ago and in the Philadelphia area last year. And you know the numbers continue to be impressive. Um, in the Triangle area, over $90 million uh, uh, of, of annual benefits um, through having the, the East Coast Green, Greenway um, coming through the region. In the Philadelphia region, $2.2 billion in one-time economic benefits, $840 million of annual benefits to, uh, to, to the region. Again, fantastically impressive numbers. Um, and yet, as I thought about what um, we as a company or tool design would like to do to support the summit and to add to the conversation and support the Alliance. Um, I started to think maybe we should um, uh, try something different or take a different approach or uh, look at things through a different lens. And um, as a company, we are doing that by um, shifting our emphasis away from the three E's of engineering, education, and enforcement uh, that, that everyone in the transportation world is intimately familiar with, and talking more about um, equity, ethics, and empathy. Um, we're conscious that the economic benefits of not just trails, but other transportation projects um, and development, uh, and, and, and whether it's transit-oriented development or other developments, those benefits in general are not shared equally among the population the current pandemic has exposed overnight the deep inequities uh, in systems, whether it's uh, healthcare, employment, housing, access to food, and of course the transportation system um, that, uh, uh, that affect people's lives. And while we are living in what we sort of euphemistically call a new normal, many of us on this, on this webinar, um, these are the conditions that a lot of people have to live in uh, lived in before the COVID-19 crisis and we've got to make sure through the work that we do uh, that we don't want uh, anyone to have to return to a situation where um, housing and jobs and food and uh, basic uh, health care is, um, is not available to them. Um, so um, the, the emphasis that we wanted to bring, the principles or the values that we wanted to apply to the, the, the project that we wanted to contribute and work with the Alliance on, uh, really um, we wanted them to, to be built, we wanted that project to be built around equity, ethics, and empathy. Um, and to make sure that the work we do and the story we tell um, uh, is inclusive and focuses on equity issues. We have to be inclusive, of course, uh, of, of all people, of all types of users, and acknowledge the disparities that do exist between uh, between people and between the opportunity people have to access uh, work and healthcare and, and so on. Um, the East Coast Greenway is, is a fantastic project. It's inspiring, it's invaluable in communities up and down the, the, the East Coast, but we wanna make sure that we really understand uh, who benefits and how they benefit and who derives the benefit from trail projects like the East Coast Greenway, particularly at the local level. And we're, uh, you know, very conscious that um, the economic benefits of a lot of development, including trail development, derives to property owners, to people who are fortunate enough to own their own homes or, or businesses, to people who have disposable income. And, time. and that just isn't everybody in the community. If we look at um, some of the more successful regional trail projects around the country, be that um, the Beltline in Atlanta, the Cultural Trail in Indianapolis, the High Line in New York City. They are extraordinary projects and the numbers uh, around the economic benefit that they have generated is extraordinary. And yet there are 
deep fundamental issues around displacement and gentrification that um, we are still grappling with as a movement and in, in those individual communities to make sure that the benefit of those projects is derived uh, equally or equitably in some, in some fashion. And uh, we can't afford to have um, the, the uh, we don't, can't afford to have those be issues uh, that we're unaware of or walk blindly into in communities up and down the East Coast Greenway as we try to complete the Greenway and provide uh, infrastructure that is um, a, a, of enormous benefit to people. Uh, we need we need for that to be self-evident evident, and for the communities that are affected by uh, this work to embrace it and to understand and, and um, derive the benefit of those projects. And in Jacksonville, you know, um, with, with all due respect to East Coast Greenway, which is a fa fantastic piece of work, I'm not sure that long distance bicycle tourism is necessarily a priority for a big chunk of the community that the, um, the, the proposed core to coast trail passes through. It is for some, I know, absolutely. Um, but uh, I also know that there are other big issues, social equity issues in Jacksonville that are um, uh, that are paramount in people's minds. Um, I have a brief glimpse into that through having had the opportunity to work on the Jacksonville Pedestrian and Bicycle Master Plan. It was actually the first major project that I got the um, opportunity to work on uh, when I joined Tool Design, um, and it was um, you know a, a fantastic project to be able to to work on and. and um, and to get to know the city of Jacksonville um, much better. And, and what we quickly understood was that, um, you know, safety is a, an extraordinarily relevant and pertinent issue in Jacksonville. The traffic safety record in Jacksonville is uh, frightening. I, I still have, because I can't figure out how to switch it off, the Google alert set up for, um, for pedestrian crashes in Jacksonville. And I've now got over, you know, six or seven hundred uh, alerts that relate to specific crashes um, in the news uh, in Jacksonville. The statistics and the stories are just horrific. The frequency of fatal crashes involving pedestrians and bicyclists is shocking. Um, it's more than once a week that someone uh, on foot or on bike is, is killed in the city. Um, and the consistency of the circumstance and the location that these crashes are occurring in, it borders on the unethical. Uh, when we, we know the conditions that exist that are creating the, the lack of safety and the danger to people uh, in the transportation system in Jacksonville. And our sense is, is that the Court to Coast Trail project must promise and deliver safety improvements so that people feel able to use the infrastructure uh, and to and feel able and safe and comfortable walking and biking to and from and along the uh, the core to coast trail as it develops in in Jacksonville. Similarly, uh, the lack of connectivity and access is a critical issue uh, in uh, in Jacksonville. Our sense again, this is on the S line trail um, in the the, the uh, north side of, of uh, Jacksonville. Uh, where the trail is literally fenced off from the, the neighboring communities. Um, and, and throughout the, the city, we discovered um, and really began to understand just how divided the city is, the community is, whether it's waterways, railroads, highways, uh, and even, unfortunately, in some cases, the access to the trail. Uh, these are barriers that are real, and it doesn't matter what sort of a pretty face we put on it and, and encourage people to you know, share the road. Uh, people just are not going to be, uh, going to feel safe and comfortable and like they can safely cross the, the, the barriers that exist in, uh, throughout the community. Um, and whether it's access to transit, to shops, to retail, to, to basic services, health services, um, getting around in Jacksonville without a car, is, uh, is not an easy or safe or comfortable proposition. And the Court to Coast Trail, if it's gonna succeed, has got to improve access for people in the local community and has got to address the equity issues that are paramount in, uh, in the community. Uh, and and there, there is a, um, 
uh, pervasive culture uh, we get discovered. Again, I, 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 I don't mean this to be um, rude or, or uh, I'm not casting aspersions on Jacksonville particularly, but what we found was a culture of, of victim blaming and um, a lack of empathy for uh, what people were experiencing uh, throughout the community um, that was um, it was very powerful and, and palpable and is something that, that has to change. And yes, you can look at a picture like this and think, what is that person doing? And you can go throughout the community in Jacksonville, you see people doing things that appear to be uh, inexplicable and just you know demonstrably what we would describe as, as wrong. And, and, uh, and people are um, always talking about the poor behavior of participants in traffic in, in the city. Um, and yet th this behavior is entirely explainable and understandable um, because of the conditions that we have, have created and allowed to exist in the community. Um, in this picture alone, you can see two people on bikes to the far left of the picture, um, one riding against traffic, one riding with on the sidewalk, not where they officially should be, of course, but what is the realistic choice? The person in the middle of the streets just got off the bus, they're trying to get to their work, uh, and um, it just uh, doesn't make sense to get to a crosswalk even where it exists because it's so far away, and even when you get there, the buttons may or may not be working, the traffic signals may or may not let you cross uh, in a protected phase, uh, there's just no incentive to behave the right way and no amount of education or enforcement is going to change this situation, unfortunately. What is necessary is a change to the physical infrastructure that, that um, both promotes and enables good behavior uh, and safe behavior in, in traffic. Um, and, and, and also provides some level of dignity as well as safety and access for people uh, that maybe don't have a choice as to how they uh, travel or choose to get around. Um, of course, uh, uh, addressing all of these issues is a pretty tall order for one trail or one uh, trail project or set of trail projects. Um, but honestly, unless the Corte Coast Trail and unless the East Coast Greenway and unless, unless other trails in similar situations in communities up and down the East Coast uh, address these issues and are aware of these issues, um, they won't be relevant to people in the community and they won't succeed or develop the support and uh, um, they won't be embraced by the community in the way that they can be. And these trail projects genuinely do help address the issues of access and safety and, and culture and can help change the conversation in communities up and down the East Coast. So. With that background, um, we, we wanted to talk uh, and, and provide for the, uh, for the conference and for the Alliance um, a report on the benefits of the Core to Coast Trail, the proposed Core to Coast Trail in the Jacksonville area um, that addressed not the economic benefits, but the benefits that might derive and which need to be understood and supported by um, the community through, through which the trail passes. And so, um, we are um, starting and, and launching really today, um, if, if, uh, if you like, a, um, a project to help um, understand better uh, how the Core to Coast Trail can benefit um, the city of Jacksonville and the residents of the communities in Jacksonville through which it passes. And we're going to do that in a study um, that, that really has three uh, pretty straightforward uh, phases. Um, and at this point, I'm going to um, try and switch over to my um, another screen here, which may or may not be successful. We'll see. Uh, hold on just a second. Bear with me. Talk amongst yourselves. Uh, Niles, feel free to help me out and figure out how to get to my, uh, how I can get to my other screen. <laughs> ah, here we go.
So can you all see a screen that says Quartz Coast Trail Project Survey? Find some way of indicating, yes, you can. Looks great. Okay, good. Apologies for that delay. It had to happen at some point. Um, so we have a, um, a story map to help uh, introduce the idea of the Quartz Coast Trail um, and uh, start a community survey on um, to try to understand the benefits of the, uh, the, the proposed Corte Coast Trail that is an extension of in addition to the East Coast Greenway uh, going through the region um, that enables participants to, to get to downtown Jacksonville uh, or, or users of the trail to get to downtown Jacksonville. Uh, but more importantly, we want to look at, at what benefit it can provide to people in the communities through which it passes. Um, so um, this um, story map uh, identifies the uh, the routes that are proposed that will make up the Quartz to Coast uh, Trail, and um, you can use the uh, you can toggle in and out to, to get close ups and and uh, bigger picture look of where the trail goes through the community. Um, and alongside the, the maps, we've got a, a little narrative and some questions in the survey that people can use uh, to give us, um, share with us the lived experience of, uh, of people in the community in, um, in Jacksonville. Uh, what we've tried to do is um, take a look at, at the population that is served by the corridors that are proposed for the Corte Coast Trail. Um, so we can look at, the, at a half mile or mile radius of the number of people that are um, potentially uh, have access to and can reach the, the Greenway with uh, relative ease and, um, uh, and take a closer look at, at who, uh, who is represented in that population and try to gather some understanding from them as to how the trail may or may not benefit them, how it may impact them. Uh, what opportunities it may uh, enable them to access or reach that they aren't currently able to reach. Um, and uh, as you scroll through the story map, looking at the, the data and the way it's presented, well, we've got a series of questions and opportunities for people to um, add information to the map to show where they might use the trail, where they currently like to walk or bike, or where they would like to walk or bike but don't feel able to do so. Um, and as you scroll through the story map and answer those questions, uh, you keep going down and you will then get to a, a series of questions on um, access and, and on the, the ability of the trail to um, provide access to not just the trail itself, but the broader network of safe walking and biking conditions. And you can see the, the red is not good um, in terms of access to a low stress bike network today. The trail has the potential to provide significant um, uh, benefits in terms of, of, of getting access and creating um, a, a, a safer, low stress network. It's uh, even with the, the S line trail that already exists uh, in portions of the of North Jacksonville here, um, this, this still the access to a network of low stress routes is largely absent and the trail has the opportunity to, um, to change that. Um, so uh, we want to ask questions in this section uh, as to um, whether people feel able to walk or bike as much as they would like or need, um, uh, just what their transportation needs are, how regularly they're able to get out and walk and bike uh, for um, exercise or for transportation. Uh, for everyone's mental health right now, it's really important for people to have these opportunities. Um, uh, but even in, in the best of times, it's important for uh, people to be able to get to um, trails and greenways. We obviously want to address the crash issue. And so we can take a look at the crash hotspots and you can see uh, where the, the worst uh, crash records are. And we've got a series of questions related to uh, safety and the perception of safety and, and give people the opportunity to, to share information uh, along the route of the trail where there are particularly dangerous places. Obviously downtown is one, uh, one key spot that needs to be addressed by the trail. Um, and so we wanna use the, the trail, which is the survey, which is open now to uh, gather people's um, 
um, stories and uh, their experiences in the community. We want to try and address the issues of equity and, and um, uh, the surrogate, uh, surrogates for equity, uh, looking at poverty and household income, uh, household uh, car ownership and, and the like, uh, to try and identify um, and try to, to get input from the communities that are along uh, the route and, and in proximity to the route um, that, uh, that we think the trail can serve the most effectively. Um, so uh, this, as I say, this is now a live survey and uh, you're welcome to fill it out and, and to share it with people in the community to, um, to help us fill out a more complete picture to go along with the data um, to, to, to gather the, the qualitative information from people's own lived experience, um, we think it will enable us to, at the end of this project, um, present some findings and results that will enable the community in Jacksonville and the East Coast Greenway Alliance and all the people that are supporting the, the Greenway and the Corte Coast Trail to make the case for why this, um, why this needs to happen, how it can happen most effectively, and, and how the benefits that we know are there off, off trails can derive most quickly and most effectively to the people that live along these corridors. Um, so uh, that, as I say, that is now um, live and you're welcome to fill it out and start sharing it with people. Um, I wanna um, close with, with one um, story from Jacksonville and then a couple of final points related to our current situation. Um, are you all back on my um, slide presentation now? Not yet, Andy. Okay. Let's try again. Are we there now? Perfect. Okay, thank you. Um, while we were um, doing some of the field work for the Vice Man, uh, my two colleagues, some of you from Jacksonville will recognize Amy Ingalls on the right. She was the bike coordinator for a while. And um, she and a colleague and I um, were doing some field work uh, to try and identify some potential bike boulevards or neighborhood greenways um, in the North Jacksonville, North of Dantan area. Amy had some ideas and we wanted to check them out and see if they would work or not. And at one point on this trip, we, um, we found ourselves in the Phoenix neighborhood. We crossed at least two sets of railroad tracks to get to the wrong side of the tracks in the Phoenix neighborhood. On the main, we were on the main street running through the Phoenix neighborhood. And um, we looked kind of out of place. Uh, to be honest. And as we were standing on the corner, looking at a map, figuring out where we needed to go next, um, this very large African-American gentleman came out of the building on the corner and just did a double take when he saw us and said, you're uh, not supposed to be, not, not supposed to be here. You're lost. You're not where you think you should be, right? And it turned out to be a pastor. I think his name was Pastor Leon, who was uh, working in the community to try and uh, improve uh, living conditions and quality of life for people in the neighborhood. And when we told him what we were doing and he told us what he was doing, uh, there was a sort of magical meeting at the mines because he had been trying to get traffic calming and bike access and improved sidewalks and, and all the things we wanted to help the city deliver. Uh, he had been trying to get into the community to, um, to, to change the way of life and to change the future and opportunities for people in the Phoenix neighborhood and was just finding it incredibly difficult to do so. And there was obstacle after obstacle in the way of him working with the city to get, to get any improvements and get changes made uh, that he knew were gonna uh, benefit the community. And the um, Corte Coast Trail has the opportunity to help uh, that initiative and numerous initiatives like that um, along the, the corridors and the, the, through the communities that, through which it passes. And it's critical that it, that it does that. And, and it's critical particularly now because um, we're in this extraordinary moment and it's, it's both an extraordinary moment and an extraordinary social experiment that really is helping us figure out what travel is essential, how we can do business 
uh, without driving everywhere all the time for every trip. Um, and, and we're seeing just a phenomenal drop off in the amount of traffic uh, for obvious reasons, not you know necessarily something we asked for or wanted, but, but here we are. Uh, we're seeing just an extraordinary drop off in traffic. Uh, we're seeing um, an immediate improvement in air quality in traffic safety and all kinds of other um, benefits that really should make us pause and think, let's get through this public health crisis now, but after we're through it, let's think about the lessons we can learn from this and the, the things that we can do um, to, to maybe return things to a different normal so that uh, people really do have access to safe and efficient um, active transportation and that people aren't afraid to cross the street or uh, the, 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 the death toll from traffic crashes in cities like Jacksonville uh, can be lowered and we can get to zero and repeat the success of places like Oslo and Helsinki. Um, those things we, we can see um, can happen, may not, may not be the way we imagined or wanted them to happen, but, but it turns out these things are in our control and the Corte Coast Trail can, can be a small part of helping to deliver that. And uh, we can see, I think Daniel uh, uh, provided these uh, numbers in a tweet a, a few days ago and um, DVRPC was the source of the, just the instantaneous increase in trail traffic and the demand for active transportation that we're seeing. And it is very local. It, it's, it's, and it's important that it's local and it's important that, that there are a lot of opportunities and places for people to walk and bike safely and healthily today. And the Quartz Coast Trail is just one way of, of, uh, of delivering more than economic benefits, more than just cash equivalents, but actual spiritual, physical, and mental benefits to the community that are frankly priceless. So uh, we hope that the report we produce over the next couple of months uh, with the survey information and the uh, quantitative data that, uh, that, that we've compiled will give the East Coast Greenway Alliance and the local community in Jacksonville another tool to make the case uh, for trail development and that the Corte Coast Trail uh, rapidly becomes a reality and the huge success that we know it will be. And with that, I'll stop and see if there are questions or comments and return to my uh, video. If that's uh, this is the right time to do that. Yes, and thank you, Andy. Um, for ease, I'm happy to pose the questions for you that we've received. Sure. Um, and first thing, some folks are asking about where they can find and share the survey. And um, oh. that <laughs> yes. we're happy to, as the Screenway, share that in our post-event survey and communications, if that's OK. Um, Yes, I think that's the best way to do it um, because, uh, as is the nature of these things, the um, the, the um, website that I showed you, I literally got seventy five minutes before the presentation, so it didn't even occur to me to think where can people access it. But we will we will give it to you, and you can share it with participants. Absolutely, thank you so much. Um, the first question is, why doesn't the trail follow the major thoroughfares of Atlanta Bo Atlantic Boulevard? Beach Boulevard and or the JTB, which I have learned is John Turner Boulevard in Jacksonville. Um, well, so I, I, I don't want to, the, the Puerto Coast Trail, um, let me stress, we didn't pick the route. Um, I would absolutely def defer to, I don't know if Colin Moore is on the, on the line, I suspect he might be. Um, uh, I would defer to him or to someone from the, the city or the local community to to, to uh, say why the particular uh, routes were chosen. I think the one obvious answer is that um, those are, they are certainly the, the three most direct routes from the uh, center city to downtown. They are also the most challenging, the most terrifying, the most um, difficult in, in, in some ways uh, in terms of dealing with current traffic volumes and speeds and the complexity of intersections. I mean, those are um, high speed, high volume, high crash corridors that are um, daunting to try to retrofit. At some point, of course, we have to do that. And the, the Corte Coast Trail in, in a bunch of different ways will show us how to do that and provide the examples of how that can be done in the future. 
but those are challenging corridors to uh, to start um, a project like this with. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> the next question is, how does this trail intersect with other trails in Jacksonville that may be a priority for other local groups? So for example, the Visit Jacksonville African American Walking Trail or planned sites and parks like the new park being dedicated to the Gullah Geechee community of Cosmo. Yeah, I mean, my understanding is, uh, again, the, the, the Corja Coast Trail was, um, was pieced together with an eye to the existing trails and future trails um, like um, Hogan's Creek and, uh, uh, and the S-Line and the, uh, the trails you mentioned. Um, and that the Corsica Coast Trail is not the only trail project that, that can and should and needs to happen in the, in the Jacksonville area. Um, so uh, I, I think the idea is the Corsica Coast Trail can provide some sort of um, focus, but also some sort of uh, catalyst for um, other trail projects. And it will help uh, reinforce the need to connect the network of trails throughout the, the, the city and the, and, and the region. Um, I, one of the, when we were doing the bicycle and pedestrian plan, um, once we'd created the network and identified a bunch of uh, 200 plus um, projects that could be uh, put together to create a network, we prioritized that, those projects and prioritized it based on community, um, community driven um, factors. Uh, safety was number one, actually connectedness and connectivity, um, if, if memory serves, was number two. Um, because there are lots of little bits of trail and bike lane and other things in the, the city and in the, in the region, but they are just um, really dispersed and really disconnected. And so um, I think part of the magic and the purpose of the Core to Coast Trail is to piece together some of those existing and, and potential projects um, into a more coherent network and create the backbone and spine of a, of a city network of trails and greenways. And how do you determine high versus low quality or low stress areas? Um, there's a, as, as there is with everything, an algorithm and a formula that's used to look at traffic, uh, traffic volume, lane, lane uh, number of lanes, lane width, all the data that we can, we can gather to find the, um, to identify the relative stress of a corridor for um, riding a bike on. Um, we use a tool that, that uh, the um, bicycle network analysis tool that compiles a bunch of data into a, a, a screen that shows you the relative connectivity and safety and comfort and accessibility of the network. Um, and so the low stress network is based on, on those factors. So as I mentioned, the, you know, the, one of the, that big red area of low, of, of, um, low quality uh, low stress networks are not a very good place to ride. Includes um, some of the trails that, that, that we mentioned. The S-Line uh, is right in the middle of that, but they are disconnected and um, there's not really a low stress network. That They may be a little oasis of, of calm, um, but uh, they're not connected to very much. And so um, overall, it's a very high stress environment and not conducive to walking and biking. Um, the trail can help uh, move the needle on that. Great. And just a couple more questions. Um, in your experience, what data has been the most convincing to government officials to, to pri prioritize these infrastructure improvements? <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, you know, I think um, the, the sort of uh, glib answer is whichever one works. There are so many um, data points, whether it's um, pointing out the horror of 160 fatalities a year on Jacksonville streets, um, you, know, you would hope that that would move the needle and make this an imperative for people. But that number has gone up since uh, we finished the bicycle and pedestrian plan three years ago, uh, which is shocking to, to, to think. Um, maybe it is the economic benefits. Maybe those are the numbers that in some cases um, work with the, with the political leadership that's in place at the time. I think that, again, one of the blessings and curses of active transportation is that it has so many benefits. We sometimes just try to get them all out at once and, and think that it is self-evident as to why people would want to support this. But I think the reality is you need to find the one or two data points that resonate with people that can make the decisions 
in the community um, that, that are going to make a difference. And um, whether you think that's the best number or the biggest priority or not, it doesn't matter. We've got to be pragmatic and figure out uh, what, what, what issue it is that is going to work well and work best and, and uh, sell the project that we're proposing. I also think, and the point of the presentation, I guess, is that it's also absolutely critical that there be community understanding, support, buy-in um, for the project, and 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 clear benefit to the community that that that, um, that, that comes from it. Otherwise, it's it's going to be kind of a non-starter, and and I think that's um, a really critical. Um, element. And that's, that's not a data point, that's kind of process driven, um, but it, it, it speaks to the importance of uh, empathy and ethics and equity uh, that we need to bring to our, all of our work. And can you talk about um, ways in which you're ensuring that the survey reaches all communities impacted? Yeah, so I, as with so many other things, um, uh, a month ago, we were on a completely different path and we're looking forward to talking to the local host committee and getting their involvement. And we were looking forward to um, even doing a workshop in the afternoon with local folks um, this afternoon to talk more about the project and figure out how we could answer that question most, uh, most effectively and, and involve people in, in the local community that was um, derailed by the fact that we're not there with you and it's, it's a lot harder to do that. And the kind of public engagement and involvement and outreach that we know is critical to this kind of endeavor, uh, we, we can't do right now for, for obvious reasons. And yes, we've got an online survey, but of course, uh, that uh, if people are gonna participate in that, they have to have access to the internet and to, uh, um, so it, that is not, that, that's an inequitable survey tool to begin with. It's not where we would choose to be. So um, when this public health crisis has passed and we can uh, regroup and, and uh, figure out how to engage with people in the community in um, new and potentially better and different ways, uh, we will do that and we will be back in touch with folks in Jacksonville to help make that happen. I wish that we were uh, further down that path and, and had had the chance to do that before the conference. Well, thanks so much, Andy. We uh, delighted to have you here and uh, coming live to people's livings, living rooms and elsewhere and um, really appreciate the work that you're doing and um, your partnership with us at the Greenway. Um, and just to remind folks, we will share the links to the survey that Andy um, has spoken about here. Um, and we'll be engaging with you even after uh, this virtual summit. I'm now gonna pass it on to my colleague, Sarah Sanford. Sarah. Okay. Hey everybody. Uh, my name is Sarah Sanford and I'm the Virginia and North Carolina coordinator for the East Coast Greenway Alliance. We're really excited to have all of you here today. So thank you for being here. Um, and we do wanna give a big thank you to all of our sponsors um, who make this possible. Our sponsors have been so patient with us as we've transitioned from an uh, in-person event to an online event. And we also have a lot of staff from some of our sponsor organizations speaking today. So. As you saw, we have Andy from Tool, we have a speaker from Make Adams, we have speakers from some of the other sponsors on this list. So thank you for all that you do sponsors. Um, and this afternoon, we have some great sessions coming up, which uh, I'll highlight now. And just a quick reminder that to view these sessions, all you need to do is go back to our landing page, greenway.org slash Southeast Summit 2020. So we'll kick off at 1.15, so in just a few minutes, with a few choices between different breakout sessions. You can watch any of those. You can also go back and forth between sessions if you'd like. Um, that's one of the upsides to being online is that you can view multiple presentations. And at two o'clock, we will have a live presentation with Iona Thomas. Um, so that's one where similar to the live presentation we just had, we'll have video, you can get on Q&A and ask questions. Um, so that'll be similar to this one. And then later in the afternoon, we have a 2.45 breakout session with three different options. Again, you can go back and forth between those if you'd like. 
um, a four o'clock breakout session with a couple different options. And at five o'clock, we will be closing live. That will be with um, me, V and Brent, all the Southeast regional coordinators. Um, so please do stick around for that. Um, if you are here right now and you have not RSVP'd, we'd actually uh, please like you to do so, so that we can capture all the attendees and send you any resources afterwards. Again, you can RSVP on our landing page, greenway.org slash Southeast Summit 2020. Just fill out that form at the top. It just takes a minute or two. Um, and a quick reminder that uh, due to a generous donor and our board of the East Coast Greenway Alliance, we currently have a $20,000 match for donations. So if you haven't already done so, please consider making a donation. Um, there are many, many staff hours and partner organization hours that go into making this summit a reality. And as many of you know, as we've been talking about all day, trails and trail organizations are more important than ever right now during this pandemic. So if you can make a donation, we would really appreciate your support. And again, you can do that through the RSVP form on our landing page. So with that, I will wrap it up. So go ahead and head back to the landing page. Um, RSVP if you haven't already and pick out whatever afternoon session you'd like to watch. So enjoy your afternoon sessions, everybody.